Uh, she earned her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1977 and immediately started at IU as assistant professor, where she's currently a distinguished professor of psychological and brain sciences and cognitive science. <clears throat> uh, her overall focus is development in young children. She uses a systems approach to her research that examines the interaction of multiple elements across time and levels of analysis. She outlined this uh, integrative theory in her very revolutionary 1994 book, co-authored with Esther Thielen, A Dynamic Systems Approach to the Development of Cognition and Action. The dominant theory of the time was that development proceeded according to a kind of biological script. As an infant's brain matured and got bigger, she or he became capable of more complex motor functions, such as grasping a toy. Smith and Thielen instead hypothesized that increasingly sophisticated maneuvers arise from the interactions among multiple systems, including visual attention, visual perception, uh, motor behavior, muscle movement, all working in parallel and in concert. For her innovative work, uh, Linda Smith has received a litany of awards, including the highest awards in Indiana, such as Distinguished Professor and the Tracy Sonneborn Award, and numerous national and international awards, including this year's William James Award, election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the prestigious David Rummelhart Prize in Cognitive Science for her contributions to the theoretical foundations of human cognition. Last year, she was a keynote speaker at APS's 2017 International Convention of Psychological Science in Vienna, Austria. Uh, tonight, she'll be discussing the game-changing insights gleaned from using wearable sensors to study how infants learn words and uh, learn other things from their point of view. But before I turn it over to her, I want to finish by noting that yesterday, when Linda accepted her award, she spent her brief time touting the virtues of Indiana University that was nice of her, but in truth, the culture she admired at the university and in the department was in no small part due to her presence and her values. Please join me in welcoming Linda Smith. Good morning, and um, I'm glad you're all here. All right, so to begin, um, as you all know, we're in a period of truly rapid barrier-breaking advances in machine learning. And these remarkable advances are coming about because instead of programming solutions, artificial learning systems are now fed massive amounts of data. And this has led feeding these machines massive amounts of data and having them learn from it has led to remarkable achievements in face recognition, in visual object recognition, in robotic vision, in complex pattern recognition, such as what you need to win at the game of Go, in finance, and in science itself. All this is changing our everyday lives in ways we barely understand. But that's not my topic today. My talk is about learning, and whatever all this remarkable advances in machine learning mean for, for our daily lives. They mean something quite important theoretically about learning. They show the power of learning and the power of the structure in the data from which you learn. However, despite all the advances that are happening in machine learning, there are growing concerns and they're showing up everywhere in journals, in the press, and talk about whether the current approach has fundamental limits. And some of the folks worrying about those possible fundamental limits of the way machine learning is working now have argued that we might have better AI, better artificial intelligence, better machine learning if we tried to mimic the learning of children. And there are increasing calls that we should try to do this. So let me give you one kind of example of the kind of learning that children can do that machines cannot yet do. So if you have a two-year-old and that child 
probably doesn't live in Indiana, but if that child sees their first John Deere tractor, just one John Deere, and it's working in a field, child watches that tractor work, and he's told it's a tractor, it's a tractor, it's a tractor, it is highly likely that from that point forward, that two-year-old will recognize all varieties of tractors, Massey Ferguson's, antique tractors, ride-on mowers, okay, but will not consider a tank or a backhoe to be a tractor. This phenomenon is known in the developmental literature as the shape bias because for most objects, and the objects I'm going to talk about today, recognition is by something we call shape, whatever that is. In the machine learning literature, it's often known as one-shot category learning, the ability to go from experience of a single instance of a category to the whole category. Now, the interesting thing is this ability in children is not inborn. They learn to do it. It emerges roughly between 2 and 30 months. And we can even show that it's learnable because we can do, I have done and other people have done training studies that can make the shape bias emerge six to 10 months earlier than would be normally expected. So the question we want to ask and what I want to consider in this talk is what has a child got that the machine does not? Okay. Now, most people, when they hear this question, they're going to think about the learning mechanisms and how the mechanisms for visual learning, let's say, are profoundly different from those used in machine learning. But all learning has two parts. There is the training data, and there are the mechanisms that do the learning. I think the data for learning, the experience on which visual category learning occurs in infants, is fundamentally different from the experiences that are used in machine learning to train computer vision and from the experiences that are used in experimental psychology studies of learning. I think they're fundamentally different in ways that um, may really be the foundation of the explanation for why the human visual system and visual learning is um, as sophisticated as it is, and um, why it is that babies can learn object names in one shot. All right. So as many of you know, and as Richard referred, referred to, we have for some time now, this is mostly, most of this work is in collaboration with Chen Yu, we have been putting um, head cameras and head-mounted eye trackers on babies. Um, along with motion sensors and other things in some studies, to um, try to understand um, the visual world from their point of view. And we've done it in a number of different ways in what we call the multisensory project, which uses um, high resolution, tiny, tiny bits of seconds to measure motion, eyes, head, everything, as well as the scene cameras. In uh, toy room studies, which are sort of in between, they're in the lab, but everything's very free-flowing, and it's just a bunch of stuff in, a, in the floor and on shelves. And then um, in another project, what we call the Home View Project, by putting head cameras on infants and having them wear them at home through their daily life. And today, most of what I'm going to talk about is um, what we call the Home View Project. And I always do this, but I'm going to do it again. I want to call out the National Science Foundation because nobody else would risk giving me the money to do this, and they did, okay? So good for them. And what we have done is we've, um, we're collecting a corpus of developmentally indexed egocentric scenes. These are the scenes captured from head cameras. So far, we have 101 infants, cross-sectional. They're aged three weeks to 24 months. We try to get six hours of head camera video in the home. Parents are told we're interested in vision. We don't care what the child is doing, anything, okay? So this is daily life. There's no experimenters um, present. We right now have nearly a billion frames. Now, why would I go to all this trouble? Why don't I just go into people's houses and take pictures of what's in the room? What you see 
depends on where your eyes are. Where your eyes are depend on what you do with your body. Where children are located and what they do with their body, how they sit, stand, rotate their heads, changes dramatically with age and yields a highly selective view of the world. So in this scene here, in this baby's environment is a dog, a clock on the wall, a man doing the laundry, a person sitting right in front of them feeding them. But not everything in that baby's view at this moment is actually part of the visual information for learning. It's quite selective what's in view. And if you have biases as to where you are located, biases as to whether or whether you can turn your head into how you move, you will get a biased view of what's near you. All the things in your house, and I'm going to show you this quite readily, are not actually very often in your view. So I want to skip over this part. Today's talk, I'm only going to talk about head camera data. That's what's in the scene in front of the baby not eye tracking. Some people get very worried about that because they're very used to laboratory experiments on eye tracking and the eyes can dart around and how do you know where they're in the scene, if they're even in the scene, but for everybody, for babies, for you, me, if you are freely able to move, you turn your eyes with your head, you turn your head with your eyes. So if I were to glance over this way at Lynn Nadell, I can just barely see him. I sort of know he's there, but if I really want to look at him, I'm going to line my head and eyes, OK? So when you have lots of data, thousands upon thousands of images, most of the time the heads and eyes are aligned. All right. The other caveat I've got to put as we go forward is that all the data I'm going to talk to you about today is based on the assumption of a corpus analysis, not about individual subjects. So if you want an analogy, you need to think about the childish corpus, which has made huge contributions, the work of Brian McWinney to do this um, in understanding child language. It has six million words of child-directed talk. It's been aggregated over many different parent and child conversations, some long, some short. They just put it all together. And then by analyzing the statistical structure of words in that aggregated corpus, they have had a lot to say about the normative statistics of the language learning environment of children. Not about what Johnny or Sally's hearing, but the normative statistics. That's what the HomeView project is. It's a billion developmentally indexed images captured by different images, infants. So I can't tell you anything about these individual infants, but it's a first step to my being able to do so or anyone being able to do so by providing the normative visual learning environment within our culture and telling you how that changes with age. All right, so how do babies do it? They don't do it at all, like experimental studies of visual category learning or visual learning. These are the four main take homes from today's talk. Babies learn a massive amount about very few individual objects, individual objects. They learn a massive amount about very few categories. They learn about different stuff at different points in time. And they generate their own data for learning by how they move their body and by their own behavior, although their social partners play a role. So basically, everything in real world experience looks like this. Okay? It is extremely skewed. So on the y-axis is frequency of something, and on the x-axis is the rank order of the individual items that we're measuring by frequency. And what you'll see in the data over and over again is that very few things are very, very frequent, and you've got a whole lot of things that you see rarely, whole lots of them, but each one of them is rare. So I'll make the first point with faces. This is actually our first published study out of the HomeView project. On the y-axis is the proportion of frames with faces. Each dot is an individual child. And in this, our first publication, there were 3,000 analyzed images per infant. They were sampled at 1 5th hertz from the entire uh, recordings of those infants. And on the x-axis is the age and month. And what you can see is the frequency of faces in these images change with age. 
It may not look like a lot to you. It's changing from roughly 30% down to 6% on that slope, but it's a huge. Frames are time. Young babies, the youngest babies, are getting 15 minutes out of every hour with a face. The older babies, as they approach their first birthday, are getting six minutes out of every hour of a face. But that's not the key point I want to make here. Whether you're young or whether you're old, just three faces account for 80% of all the faces you see as a baby. Okay. We know that over the first year of life, babies are learning a lot about faces, individual people, uh, gender, age, emotional views, and they're learning most of that from three people. Mom, dad, and let's say grandma, okay? So we did this theoretical curve here which shows um, the cumulative hours of faces as a function of age if you assumed that in our corpus it was one child. And um, we put in here, we multiplied things out knowing how many hours normatively babies are awake at each of these hours, and so this is a cumulative experience of faces. And look at that, you're building everything you know about faces on a huge cumulative experience of three people. Okay. Critically, it's not just faces, it's also the objects in infants' lives. Toddlers see a variety of cups, yes, they most certainly see the McDonald's cup and their mom's cup. But I can tell you, their experience of their own sippy cup is massive, okay? Unparalleled by any other cup experiences. The experiences are massive and they are highly varied. They see their sippy cup in many different poses. They see it partially occluded. They see it in good light and bad. They see it far and near and they do this day in and day out. And we know, and any of you who has a toddler knows, that that toddler will recognize their sippy cup across the hall with just the tip sticking up from the bottom, dropped in the garbage can, wherever. They are experts at recognizing their sippy cups under incredibly diverse visual conditions and quite suboptimal conditions. Nobody, by the way, trains people in psychology experiments to learn categories with images like this, and nobody would give these images to a convolutional deep learning network and hope to get much out of it, although we are doing that. All right. So in its course, not just the sippy cup, that they have this massive experience about one individual object in all these varied contexts. It's a family dog. It's their own shoe. It's their cereal bowl. It's their blankie, so forth. So I think the question we need to know, and I don't actually have the answer for you yet, invite me back in about two years, is what is the latent structure in these data? What kind of regularities can the learner find in such massive experience of very few objects? What are they getting from these experiences? My conjecture is that because it's a single object that they know and care about, because the daily experiences are massive and highly variable, that there is probably findable structure that is essential to understanding what a three-dimensional object is and how to represent that three-dimensional object. Now, you would think in terms of usual theories of category learning that, you know, it's not good to be trained on cups with mostly experiences with just your sippy cup. Heck, it's blue and green. Maybe you'd end up thinking your sippy cup is blue and green. But I think this is probably not a problem. They mostly, by far, see their favorite sippy cup, but they see it in such varied conditions. Okay. And they also see, that's that long tail over there, in aggregate, many, many hours of lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of other cups, each one quite rarely. Okay. So is this kind of the secret sauce for making of a, a powerful visual learner. So 
The other thing I need to tell you is that, so they learn a lot, a massive amount, this is clued here, they learn a massive amount of very few individual entities, that's what I've just told you. They also learn a massive amount about a very few categories. And now I want to turn to data from eight to 10 month olds. And since not <clears throat> everybody in here is a developmental psychologist, let you know something about eight to 10 month olds. Um, these are awkward babies in a sense. They are working mostly on trying to sit stably, manipulating objects, on standing, they're not very good at it. These are the babies who when they're sitting and they reach for a toy just out of their reach, topple over, okay? Um, but they're working on it all. And this is also the period that is just before, although some people think not before, during, the earliest stages of visually learning about object and noun categories, the categories in your world. So in um, one study, we looked at eight infants, um, eight to 10 months old from the corpus. And what we did is we wanted something to aggregate over that would be likely to have um, some recurring object. So what we did was we, just, it's a misuse of the word, we said we're gonna look at meal times because babies eat a lot, five times a day in the first year of life. Now meal time, whenever I used to say this, people would think you're talking about babies sitting at a high chair being fed by their mom. We counted as meal time any event that had food or dishes in it. If a dog was eating, meal time. Cheerios on the living room floor, meal time, okay? Anything with food or dishes by anybody counts as meal time. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna spend time on how we did this, but what we have is a procedure for rapidly annotating scenes in which we can get the names of the objects in the scenes. Um, I'm gonna go over that fast. You can read about it if you're interested. And the first thing to know about the scenes of eight to 10 month olds is that they are highly cluttered. There are on average nine to 10 nameable objects. We didn't allow people to tell us about screws on the wall or doorknobs. Nameable basic categories of objects, on average nine to 10. So lots of clutters, lots of different object types. In fact, the Turkers who labeled these images, there were, um, I think in this set, I think there were 8,000 images in this, in this study that we analyzed in those 8,000 images, the Turkers named 745 basic level noun categories as present in these images. But not everything is equally present, okay? So what we have here is the proportion of frames in which individual object categories occurred by the rank order of their frequency. And what you can see is there are a few objects, the sippy cup, the table, the spoon, baby shoe, the bottle, okay, that are very, very frequent. And most of the things are not frequent at all, okay? It's also the case that we could look at when the names for these object categories were acquired. And for many of the high, for all of the high frequency items, these babies are eight to 10 months of age. They aren't talking, okay? But for object names that are normatively acquired before 16 months, we call those first nouns, all the very prevalent objects in these visual scenes are named by nouns that these babies probably don't know yet, but will know in a few months. This suggests to us that visual pervasiveness itself day in, day out, hours upon hours, from many different viewpoints, may be critical to visual learning about objects, to building segmentation, to finding things in clutter, to building strong visual memories so that you can eventually get a word attached to them. Now you may be thinking, visual pervasiveness also likely means the pervasiveness of their spoken names. So maybe there's some kind of supervisory signal here that is um, helping them learn these object categories. Um, these are data that I hope will get submitted this summer. We're pretty close to done. Um, it's a new larger data set, uh, seven to 11 month olds, um, 13,000 coded scenes, again, coding one image every five seconds. 
And what we also did for um, these head camera images, the head camera also records the sound, is we transcribed all sp adult speech. Okay? These are eight to 10 month olds, they're not talking. All adult speech. And we did it in five second intervals so we could match them up with the images. Now parents are not talking a lot, only uh, less, less than half of the time are they um, talking. Okay, what I'm gonna show you next takes a little bit of explanation because the best way I could show it. On the y-axis is the frequency of bends. The gray is the frequency of object names. The red is the frequency of the visual objects in the scene and they're ordered by the object frequency, the visual frequency of the objects in the scene. Now, you're gonna notice that the max up there says 200, but I got 13, 14,000 images that were analyzed here. Okay, that's so you can see the words. You need to go, the most frequent object was in 7,245 scenes, about half the scenes. You gotta go up a couple stories on this graph, okay? So what you should see, first of all, is parents are not naming these objects to kids this young very frequently at all. And um, there's no relationship between the frequency of the object names and, um, and the frequency of the objects, the visual objects in the scenes. There's certainly more to be done with this, but I think what we're really talking about is visual learning, visual learning about visual objects, preparing the way for breaking into language. Um, and what that suggests is that um, the key learning, if it is visual, may be beyond the naming moments themselves, not with the supervisory signal of the naming moment as the key factor here. Keep that in mind, I'm gonna come back to it. Okay, so infants receive massive day in and day out experience with a selective set of object categories. Within those categories, they receive massive experience of a few individual objects and limited experience with lots of other instances of the same category. What does the visual learner learn from this? Okay. I don't have the answer to that question, but I'm absolutely certain that it is a key player in how we understand the prowess of human visual learning and so-called one-shot category learning. All right, more about how babies do it. Babies learn about different stuff at different times, okay? During the first year of life, baby sensory motor abilities change dramatically. And with those changes, with reaching, with sitting steadily, with walking, infants open and close gates, open and close gates, to different visual experiences. So the scene contents and composition that dominate at eight to 10 months that we just talked about, they are not there at one to three months. And um, they differ from those of infants 12 to 18 months. So let's start by talking about the one to three month olds. And again, for people who don't know much about developmental psychology, babies in the first three months of life, they have minimal motor skills, including little head or trunk control. It gets better as those three months go by. The eye is very limited in its ability to focus some people call this, talk about in terms of acuity, but it's really the optics of the eye, and they need constant care by mature social partners. Experiments, laboratory experiments, tell us that babies this age can discriminate high contrast, low spatial frequency images, and that they prefer, that should be a P, to look at high contrast, low spatial frequency images. In our look at this, we have been looking at infants who are one to three months of age and six to eight months of age. And in the analyses I'm gonna to talk to you about now, it's 20,000 images. The corpus is just getting bigger and bigger as you march along. 20,000 images for the one to three month olds and uh, almost 29,000 images for the six to eight month olds. And we could tell when we were looking through the one to three month old images that they just were not like 
older kids' images. But we didn't quite know how to do it, so what we did was we trained Turkers to look for images that had faces in them, because the little baby images have lots of faces. And we asked Turkers to tell us what images had a category that we called nothing much. Um, we gave them examples and told them to find them. These are images which seem to us to be very, very frequent in the young babies, um, the very young babies' views. They're images of lights, of the corners, of a crack in the wall, ceilings, fans. Okay. And then, of course, regular scenes. Just Turkers find things that look like somebody took a picture. Doesn't have to be a good one. Okay. The very young babies have many more faces. We already told you that. One to three month olds and six to eight month olds, and twice as many of what we call these nothing much images. Now, if you look at the distribution of the low level uh, visual properties of these images, they differ within each category, or the two of the categories, for the younger babies versus the older babies. So this is, I'm showing you contrast here. That's just in case people don't know what high contrast and low contrast is in an image. It's how much difference there is in the intensity in, in the images. And what you can see for the nothing much images, for the nothing much images up here, is that lower baby, younger babies, nothing much images have higher contrast. Not only are they more frequent, they're actually better images with higher contrast. That's a histogram, frequency of images, contrast on the x-axis. The older babies in gray, their nothing much images are really just moments when they were looking at something that didn't have much in it. They're really, they're low contrast, not great images, okay? When you look at the faces, for the younger babies, again, the green, their faces are pushed up to high contrast, and the older babies are down a little bit. That's a reliable difference. And um, their regular scenes don't differ all that much. Now, one of the ways that you usually, what you would expect for young babies is that they would have more energy, more contrast at the low spatial frequencies than at the high spatial frequencies. And you can usually represent that in curves such as this. I think it, these differences are very meaningful, but I think they're hard for people to see. So what I'm going to show you next is the distribution of slopes, because I think it is easier to see. The question you want to ask is, is high contrast at, low, at the lower spatial frequencies for younger babies? That's what you would predict, given the optics of their eye. The, a yes answer means a steeper slope. And what you can see, again, is that proportion of images on the y-axis, slope on the x-axis is that for the nothing much scenes and for the face scenes, the younger babies have much steeper slopes. That is, the energy is at the low spatial frequencies. The, typical, the regular scenes don't differ all that much. So why am I telling you all this? Why is this so interesting to me? So babies are seeing, very young babies are seeing, you know, a quarter of the images they see are faces. Another 20% are these Hubel and Weasel stimuli. And they are high contrast, low spatial frequency. It's not even clear, we're beginning to do this now, put filters that mimic what babies can see on the regular scenes. It's not even clear they're getting much from those regular scenes at all because of the optics of their eyes. This would mean that we are feeding a visual system for its first three months of setting up, really, with a very distinct set of visual images. High contrast, low spatial frequency, the faces of the people who love you, taking care of you, that come near close, and walls and ceilings and edges, okay? How does this very early, very different biased input matter to the development of the human visual system? The, Ventral visual system in humans consists of a hierarchy of feature transformations and the tuning of the early layers in that system actually lay the pathway for all the learning that's yet to come. And that first tuning 
has a very odd bit of input, okay? Does it matter? Okay. We don't know, and um, I actually think we really do need to know if we want to understand why the human visual system is the way it is. The other point to make, the last point to make about um, how the data changes um, as a function of the infant's change is it's not just the low-level visual statistics that change as the infant's changes. The content and the scene structure changes dramatically with age as the infant develops more um, more autonomy and more skilled central mo sensory motor abilities. One thing we found early is that, um, so we have faces and these walls and ceilings dominate for young. We have objects and clutter in this middle period of eight to 10 months old. As you get older, 12 to 24 months of age, infants play a big role in controlling what they see by um, engaging objects with their hands. So there is a shift with development from scenes with lots of faces to scenes with lots of hands. And what I want to do is the last little bit talk about, just look at this, OK? This is a 12-month-old. This is like a perfect visual stimulus for any kind of learning about that object. Holding it close, long periods, sustained time. You even have mom come in, and she's going to name it for him. So what we know, and you don't see images like this at, um, you don't see images like that at uh, eight to 10 months of age. They're not good enough with their hands. They can't hold things long enough. They can't bring it close. But after the first birthday, there is a lot of this. And we know from actually a huge amount of work that we've done now that what toddlers do is they create clean images of single objects that dominate in the scene. And we also know that when parents name objects at those clean moments, the infants are much more likely to learn the object name. We also know that uh, the baby's body, I won't go into this so much detail, that the baby's body plays a big role in um, organizing this learning. That Getting those good, clean images depends on head stability, on holding behavior, on head and eye alignment. All of this comes together around 12 months of age. Um, I will point out one thing. So you see that good visual signal down there where the mom is holding the kind of W-shaped thing? Naming at that moment is not as likely to lead to learning by the baby. Baby holding is much more important during the naming moment because it stabilizes the baby's head and stabilizes the image for several seconds around the naming moment. And that leads to my um, next point. All this work has suggested to me, which I said in the beginning, that it's a wrong idea to just concentrate if you want to understand object category learning or object name learning, to just concentrate on the naming moment. There are visual experiences that are surrounding those naming moments that may actually matter much more. When you watch what's happening with a child in play, they got one object, they picked it up, they put it down, they pick up another object, they look at it, that one may get named, put it down. Around those naming moments are a lot of visual experiences. And we're trying to look at this in uh, some seriousness now. We know that um, the specific nature of the views that uh, toddlers generate rotating of those views around the major axis in depth, for example, um, predict object recognition and memory, their self-generated views. We know that their object manipulation and the views they dwell on and the rotations they make predict recognition from sparse representations of three-dimensional shape. We know that uh, it predicts new category learning. And we know that the variability in the uh, 2D images, the properties of the 2D images, themselves um, predict uh, object name vocabulary at a later date, how well they're going to learn words later. All right, so I'm coming to my end here. So what I've told you is all about the training data. And unfortunately, I haven't made, not there yet, much about the learning mechanism that capitalizes on that structure. We know more than I've told you about, about what babies are learning about three-dimensional shape. 
but we still don't know what is being learned from the whole long developmental curriculum throughout the visual system that prepares the system for that learning. And we don't know what the mechanisms are that do the learning. And I have not told you that any of this leads to one-shot visual category learning. I think it does, but I don't have the, uh, don't have the link. I'm gonna get there, all right. Understanding this, I think, and making that link, understanding the role of the environment and visual experiences in their structure is really critical to making that link, not just because one-shot visual category learning is such a sexy topic to people in machine learning, but because it has fundamental importance to children. The shape bias is lacking in children with language learning problems. Everybody with language learning problems. This suggests that language learning does play some role in all this. Children with ASD, deaf children who are not doing well with cochlear implants, Specific language impairment children do not show a shape bias, do not do one-shot category learning. And uh, you can also show that visual recognition is uh, measurably perturbed in these children. So I think some of the questions for the future are these. Could differences in the development of the shape bias and visual object processing lie in the data for learning as much as in the internal machinery that does that learning? Because the data are generated in part in real time by the learner's own behavior, per perturbations of infant sensory motor development will cause perturbations in visual learning. But this offers a pathway to intervention. Could we alter the developmental outcomes for the good of children by providing different, least structured, giving them a workaround if something's amiss, day in and day out data for learning? And I think another key question is how much does the data for visual learning vary in different environments uh, with different socioeconomic conditions, with culture? We're making some uh, steps in this direction and hope to publish our first paper this summer from a parallel home view project where we're, that we're collecting in India um, from children um, who live in a rural, poor village with no electricity. All right, very different visual experiences. All right, and finally with the question that I began with, could we make smarter machines, smarter one-shot category learning, just by giving them infant head camera images, I think that's quite possible. So to conclude, um, what I've told you is that infants have a different composition and content in terms of the training data than those used in computer vision and in the study of human learning. And the structure of that is very, very different, so. I'd like to thank um, all the people in my lab and all my collaborators. Thank you. Uh, do we have time? I don't know. I can say, I can, I'm, I'm seeing you now, yes. Yeah. I, I was wondering about, because you're talking about children with um, language development problems, and so I was wondering the importance of the holding, and because I may be connected with, with children who have motor problems, like cerebral palsy. Yes, it, will, it, it should absolutely have connections to people with cerebral palsy. So my colleague Chen Yu, I'm a very minor player in this, but I can tell you what he's doing. He's working with, um, both uh, people who um, at Cincinnati Hospital with our, uh, siblings of uh, baby sibs of children with ASD, very young, and also with um, deaf children um, who, are, who are getting or just after they get implants. And collecting the same kind of data here and actually doing the high head movement, eye hand coordination. And there are clear perturbations in those systems, okay? Um, you know, for the kids with implants, it's because their implants is because they have a very different language learning task that they're trying to master, and so the way they in interact with the world. And um, ASD children, it's a kind of just oddities and timing and coordination. But the idea is that we'll be able to show that the visual input is different. It should certainly be the case for children with cerebral palsy. Okay. What about blind children? With what? Blind children. Children are born blind. Oh. 
Children who are born blind have a different developmental trajectory. They're going to come in through the hands. It's sort of like deaf children of deaf parents learning language. They're like just going to go on a totally different route, okay? We're a very... Mike Mersnick once said it was worse to have a perturbed sensory system than to have none at all. And I think in some of this, that's actually correct, okay? Yes? I know. So what's the integration across these senses? And I was really struck by the, by the picture you showed of the, of the mom holding the blue W object. And you said that it's important for the child to stabilize that image. It's probably just as important to have the tactile experience. Actually, I don't think so, and we're beginning to test that, OK? I actually think this is mostly about visual learning with maybe only a little bit of haptic influence, these kids are not too good at getting information from their hands about shape, although it could play a role. There's all kinds of multimodal interactions. I actually love that stuff and don't want to put it down. But I think the, the key factor may really be in stabilizing the image, getting a good, clean image that's stabilized. Um, they, when they're holding an object, they keep that image there about five seconds around the naming event. And we can look at when naming events lead to learning and when they don't lead to learning. I didn't present those data here. But naming events by the parent that don't lead to learning often are ones in which they shift very rapidly from the object to another object instead of lingering on it, sort of the after effect. They don't hold it long enough afterwards. So we are actually doing um, regular experiments on babies right now trying to mimic the visual experiences in these kinds of time quality and see whether we can show that it's primarily, you generate the visual information, but it's a generated visual information. I think that might be the big player. Maybe. OK. Lynn. Of course, they're not really stabilized. They've got moving little heads and bodies. OK. What I mean is that the, the, the scene OK, the scene remembers, remains one big thing in view, everything, nothing stable on the thing. Every, one big scene in view as opposed to in view and then to rich. Do you know what I mean? That kind of still in content. No, no, they're always moving. Everything's Mary. You told us about loss of learning, starting out with looking at faces, and so we're seeing faces that are not shaped by us. Okay. Yeah, I think because it's so tightly linked to language, I think there's a couple kinds of issues, okay, that may be playing out. First of all, virtually every atypical cognitive developmental trajectory has a sensory motor perturbation along with it, okay? Um, specific language impairment, ASD. ADHD, almost everything, OK? Some of these are minor in view of what you might look at somebody doing. But there are coordination timing, particularly eye-hand coordination and um, other kinds of issues that could be playing a role. It could be, as some people think, maybe more basic statistical learning, but it's statistical visual learning that is setting the stage. But we absolutely know that word learning is also playing a role, OK? That that stage from 12 to 24 months, when children are really handling objects, when parents, I should have told you this. So my 8 to 10 month olds, in those videos, parents are not talking to the uh, kids much about the objects at all. We have another st data set we're working on now, which is going to compare to that, which is the older kids, 12 months and older, 12 to 18 months. And we can show that when babies are talking, parents start naming. Do you know what I mean? There's this really kind of sharp switch around the first birthday. It depends on you know children who talk earlier or later, probably. But when children are actually talking, parents shift to rap to naming everything. And I'm sure that learning signal starts playing a very big role and may, in fact, be the only link that kids 
with specific language impairment or lacking, for all I know, okay? But um, all that needs to be worked out. Yeah. What you just said reminds me of the distracting lack of correlation between, uh, between uh, the visual experience and the naming during the first 12 months. And um, I'm wondering, you know, much I'm learning, that the four visual categories are well learned, even though they don't hear the names very often. What is the weight? It might occur earlier. I mean, you know, the way people, the way you explain one-shot learning mechanistically is you have to build an internal representational system that can look at one example and come up with a description of it that leads to the appropriate generalization, okay? That's, so presumably, this is why my thoughts are that one of the critical links, and everything in developmental is multi-causal, has more than one pathway, we're very adaptive creatures. We can find roots even when you wouldn't think you would be able to. Um, but I think one of the critical links is actually this seeing of well-known objects in suboptimal as well as optimal viewing conditions for building a visual system. If you really know your sippy cup, then if you're seeing it upside down from the tip with the dog sitting half on it, you can almost rebuild the whole sippy cup from that little bit of vision, okay? And so I'm thinking that really what you would think would be the worst thing for learning, a whole lot of experience with one thing, might actually really be um, not the whole story, but the a key part of that story. Oh, of course. Uh, well, uh, that's what I'm trying to clarify. I'm not familiar with it, but what in study, what is being said in your research? Okay, so I, I could answer this question in two ways. One is to tell you that current deep learning networks, CNNs, are trying to mimic the hierarchical transformations in the visual system. But I'm going to say something more radical. I'm going to have my good friend Barbara Landau go nuts here, okay? But, um, <laughs> All forms of learning, computationally, are dimension reduction. Some mechanisms are faster, some are slower, some are better, some whatever, but they're dimension reduction, okay? They're looking for the structure in the data itself, okay? They could have biases one way or another way. We are actually thinking, we're just, in work we're doing right now, we're taking the baby data, and we're putting it through sort of standard CNNs, convolutional deep learning networks, and we can show that the baby data is better. And that the baby data, if we're lucky, this will be at NIPS, okay? That the baby data is um, able to build generalization better than the training sets that are standardly used. Yeah, well, I mean, it is like Gibson because you create your own, it's, a, it's the relation, it is like Gibson, it's the relation of your eyeballs to the world that creates the data. That is the data, your eyeballs to the world, it's that relation. Yes, that's probably, I'm sure that's correct, yes, I'm sure that's correct. Yeah. By holding it. It's fascinating because actually, if, if you put those images, try to create an algorithm to identify the object with hands in them, it does terribly. If you take to, to recognize the object within what? To re if you ask a machine to try to recognize objects when there are hands in the scene, grasping the object, it does terribly. That's because they're trained on ImageNet. You need to train them on baby images. Yes, they do. That's a huge problem for machines. So all I'm saying is, you've got to figure out why the 
babies can cope with the hands, whereas the machine Okay. Can't First of all, babies spend roughly, I just want to set quick this. Okay, she is asking, she, so Barbara said, machine learning algorithms have a terrible time recognizing objects that are in hands. That's because they're not trained on objects in hands. I'm just, they, they, current machine learning only knows what it's taught. It has no nuance, no nothing. And I'm not making any claims that those programs, are, that their learning mechanisms are right, okay? Other than in the large sense that they're looking for latent structure in the data. Okay, in the mathematical sense, and that's all learning is anyway. So, but it is, it is the case that when you're looking at babies 12 months and up, they got their cute little hands on those objects, and they're rotating those objects, and they're seeing multiple views, and they're doing things with them. But I'm going to tell you, from seven months down, they're looking at the world, okay? And other people's hands are on objects, but not an over lot. Hands are not in view under seven months, their own or anybody else's, all that much. Okay? That's the paper that's in cognition. Okay? Um, they're not in view all that much. So um, they, all, they have a lot of prior learning when their hands are not in view. But nobody's training those networks with hands on objects, adult pictures. <laughs> 